direct you back to the book of 2 Peter chapter 2 today in a message that we've entitled Divine Judgment. This is a direct continuation of what we studied together last week, which was entitled Beware of False Prophets. And rather than going through this chapter together verse by verse as we usually do, we've taken it in a little bit of an unusual way. Going through the whole chapter, first of all, looking at the attributes and the motivations and the results of false teachers in the church and the danger that they, the risk that they pose to God's children. And in the second message from 2 Peter chapter 2, we want to look at the examples of divine justice that we find in chapter 2. Now understand before we look into this passage that the concept of today that we consider today builds on the concept that we studied last week. And so while we look at God's judgment in more of a general sense today, understand the concept that sparked this thought for Peter, and of course we understand through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is the false teacher. So the moral of the story today as we consider God's judgment in Peter's mind at this time was that there is a judge even of those who would pervert the word of God and those who are wolves, not someone who's sincere that loves Jesus that may be wrong on an issue or two or more, but those who are ravenous wolves that come into the flock dressed like a sheep to hurt the sheep, people who would creep in unaware to the church as we read in the book of Jude. They creep in unaware, ordained of old, to this condemnation, that is to say their sentence was already revealed in the word of God and in the counsel of God. He's already chosen how to judge them and to judge them. But we're learning specifically of predators and the danger that they pose to the church. So please understand as we, as we go into this, we're not talking about people who love Jesus but disagree with us on a doctrine or a portion of the word of God. I think I made the point last week that the wolf has a pretty good idea that he's the wolf. Now, there's no fear of God in his eyes because in his heart, he really doesn't believe in the God of the Bible. But to him, the church is a place where he can create wealth for himself and popularity for himself and notoriety. And it's a place where he can achieve a great deal of power and ease in his life, and different wolves have different motivations. Some of them come in to prey on young folks in an abusive way. Some wolves come into the church because they want to make millions upon millions of dollars, and there are schools that teach you how to do this. I'm not going to name the names of some of these seminaries, but uh, I'm, they're literally places where false teachers are trained to be false teachers, but they have to know in their heart many of these people, what they're doing, and the reason that they don't care is because they don't know God in their heart. If you really know God in your heart, and you know what the Word of God says, and you know when you're, quote, healing people by slinging a, your jacket around and people are falling over and all this nonsense that takes place, you have to know that it's snake oil. You have to know that. It's like the magician who pulls the rabbit out of the hat. He knows that it's not real, and he may deceive all the kindergartners, and they may be impressed, but he knows that he's not really pulling a rabbit out of his hat. He knows that. But he doesn't, the false teacher, have any fear of God, and so it doesn't bother him at all because he doesn't really in his heart know that God is there and believe in God. But what we read here is the promise that the wolf is going to have a judgment from God. The wolf is going to be judged by God. Now, as another bit of information up front, there are some people who act as a wolf who God's grace will later change and it will totally change everything about their life. Think about Saul of Tarsus. That man looked like a wolf. He was rounding up Christians, executing Christians, torturing Christians, demanding that they deny the Lord and God in his grace changes his heart and arrests him and Saul of Tarsus is never the same again. So understand that God can even change the heart of a person who is at one time a wolf. After all, we're all sinners. We're all totally depraved. Total depravity means universal depravity. We're all depraved universally in mankind. And so we all have the 
inclination before we know Christ to be like the wolf. If someone is a wolf and then comes to know Christ, well, their sins are forgiven them, just like Saul of Tarsus' sins were forgiven him. As we go into this passage today, we're going to look at three judgments in particular, and these judgments, according to 2 Peter and also the book of Jude, stand forever as testimonies of God's righteous indignation against wickedness. So we're going to study a lot today. You might refer to what you might refer to as case studies of God's judgment in the world, case studies of God's judgment. And our message, again, is entitled Divine Judgment. The first of these is the angels that sinned. And that ought to be a subject that when it's introduced, sparks intrigue in your mind because it's a mysterious subject that we don't have a lot of information about in the Word of God. The second example that we consider is the flood in the days of Noah. And the third example that we'll consider is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And these stand as monuments of God's righteous indignation against wickedness in the world. You'll find throughout the Bible that Bible writers in the Old and the New Testament will periodically refer back to some of these monumental moments where God's judgment is so clear and so evident that they literally stand as testimonies through time of the fact that God has the final say and God is the judge of the quick and the dead and God will judge the wicked and there's no escaping him in that last day, in that final day. There will be people who are hiding in the dens and the caves of the earth trying to escape the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb, what an interesting contrast in nature. The wrath of the Lamb. Lambs are not usually wrathful creatures. But there's coming a day in which the Lamb of God will come back in His wrath, and there are people in the world that will literally be hiding from the wrath of the Lamb of God because He will come back to judge this world. I think in one of our hymns it puts it in this poetic way that there will be people who will call upon the rocks and the rills to hide them and to cover them, and yet it will will be all in vain because... There's no stopping the judgment of God through Christ Jesus. Now, this ought to be a doctrine that while it is a fearful thing, it ought to cause you in your heart to have comfort and peace because you know through this that all of those that uh, have afflicted you or God's children through the history of the world, there will be a day of judgment, a day of reckoning for them. Adolf Hitler was a man that murdered, had Millions of people murdered. Genghis Khan was a man who was ruthless and barbaric. Joseph Stalin was a man that had millions of people, even his own citizens, put to death. And sometimes those from a secular perspective look at that and they say that this was such, and it is, such a tragedy that will never be undone. But the gospel says, no, there is a day of recompense for the tyrants and the murderers and the serial killers and the rapists and the robbers and those that abuse children. There's a day coming when Christ will have full vengeance upon the wicked. No one escapes his judgment. Now, if that statement sparked your mind, no one escapes his judgment, you have to understand that we would not have escaped his judgment had he not poured his wrath out on his son. Now, why is that? Well, As we consider this, just think on the fundamental, immutable attributes of God. God is, first and foremost, holy. He's upright. He's righteous. God is a holy God, is also a God of justice and judgment. What was the first thing that God did to man when he put him in the garden? He gave him a law. And so from the very beginning of time, God has revealed himself as a God of law, a God of right and wrong, a God of black and white, a God that says thou shalt make no graven images, a God that says thou shalt not commit murder, a God that says thou shalt not steal, a God that says thou shalt not lie or bear false witness, a God that says thou shalt not covet, and that is the law. And there is no escaping his law, but he is a God of laws. Now, these laws reflect his righteousness, but at the same time, these laws are beneficial for mankind. For example, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not kill. Can't you see how glaringly beneficial that is 
for people here in this world. You see, you're the people that would be killed. So thou shalt not kill is something that God gave to protect people in the world. Thou shalt not steal isn't something that robs people of their fun. And there are people in the world that look at that as, well, that just robs all of our fun. Well, I don't find it fun to steal. But what that law does is it benefits you because it makes it wrong for people to take something that you own. Would you like it if someone came into your house and took something from you that you worked hard to purchase? No, you would call the police, you would be outraged. And so laws are beneficial also for society. They reveal God's righteousness and they're beneficial for society. God is a holy God. God is a God of laws. And so God is a God of justice and judgment. Now, because God is holy and God is a God of laws and God is a God of judgment and justice, this next attribute of God will explain to you why indignation is inevitable. God is immutable. What does the word immutable mean? Every one of you on the remote control on your, for your television at home, if you have a television at home, you have a button on there that means mute. It says mute. This word mutant, mutate. They all come from a common root, the same root of the word immutable, and it means to change. God is immutable, meaning that God is unchangeable. And so since God is holy and he's a God of judgment and justice and he's a God of laws, right and wrong, and he is immutable, his indignation, his wrath, and his judgment upon the wicked is an inevitability. It is an inevitability. Think just for a moment on the concept of injustice in the world. What is injustice? Let's say, God forbid, someone that you know and love is murdered by a killer. Now, that's the worst case scenario. That's a 3 a.m. phone call that none of us ever want to receive. But it's, it's a reality in the world. In fact, just this past week, twice in our general area, once in our town and once in Gunnersville, there were multiple cases of murders just happening right around where we live. We, we sometimes live in a little compartmentalized life, and we don't realize these things happen around us. There are things that happen you know, in, in major cities, not like our cities, but they happen in places like Gunnersville, and they happen in places like South Huntsville, and, and in Madison, and places such as that. Let's say someone that you know and love is taken by a wicked person, but they go to the court system... They're tried, and the lawyer, capitalizing on a loophole, gets them set free. How angry would you be that your loved one was taken from you and justice was not carried out in this world? That would be the definition of injustice. Injustice isn't only when someone that is innocent is tried and found guilty and imprisoned, but injustice is also when someone who is guilty does not pay for the crime that they have committed. Because God is a God of justice, injustice is an impossibility. His righteous indignation and wrath on wickedness is inevitable. He will have his day of judgment upon wickedness. Now, before we look at these three passages together, I want to, as a way of a preface, just briefly touch base on the fact that what we're going to read today, and much of what we read in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Second Peter, parallels directly to the outline, the breakdown of the book of Jude. If you're a Bible reader, you may have noticed that the book of Jude and the book of Second Peter, chapters 2 and 3, are almost a mirror parallel one to the other. Have you noticed that? All right, Bible readers, Bible readers in the congregation. How many of you have noticed that? Somebody raise your hand, please. Don't make me disappointed. Nobody. <laughs> Nobody in the entire building has noticed that 2 Peter chapter 2 and 3, chapters 2 and 3 and Jude identically mirror each other. Well, I want to leave that thought with you and, and spark it and then point out some similarities and then go back and give you a couple of options why. Now, notice this with me. I'm going to put my finger over in the book of Jude and also here in 2 Peter 2. And you might want to flip back and forth with me. First of all, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, Peter says, There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you 
who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. And we considered that verse last week. Now look at the book of Jude chapter 4. There's only one chapter in Jude. For there are certain men crept in unaware who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God unto lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. If you continue reading in 2 Peter chapter 2, you'll read that they even deny the Lord that bought them. So there's a denial of God and an interjection of false teachers in the church among the people of God. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, now look at the book of Jude, verse 6, The angels which kept not their first estate and left their own habitation. See, it's following the same outline. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6, God turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned the people there with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Jude verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. You see how these, these are following the exact same outline? That's not even half of it. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 10 speaks about people who were not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, that is to say they're haters of dominion and authority in the world that is relevant, valid, that God has inspired, has placed into the world. The book of Jude verse 8, likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Same thing we read in 2 Peter is in the book of Jude. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 15, which have forsaken the right way, this is speaking of the false teachers, that forsook the way of truth for financial gain, much like Balaam did. They've forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozer, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Now look at the book of Jude, verse 11. Woe unto them, they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and the perishing in the gainsaying of Cory. Now that Cory is one of the false teachers early on in the, in the wilderness period of the nation of Israel who was destroyed by God, personally destroyed by God. He, I believe, was the individual perhaps that the ground opened up and swallowed him in. And then closed up. So literally God caused the ground to devour up this false teacher. And he's one of the many examples of God judging wickedness. And these major examples like that stand as testimonies for us to look at and say, God did this in the past. God is going to do this again in the future. They stand as monuments to the wrath of God. His wrath again being based upon his holiness, his justice, and his judgment and his immutability. So we have... In this narrative, Balaam in both books. Second Peter two seventeen. These are clouds, or excuse me, wells without water, clouds carried with a tempest. In the book of Jude, verse twelve, these are spots in your feasts of charity. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds. So Peter describes them as a well without water, and we observed last week that the false teacher can't quench the thirst you have for the gospel. They can't quench the thirst you have for God or his word because they're teaching a lie and they're pretending. So there's no spiritual benefit. It's like, as we read in Jude, they're a cloud without water. It looks like a rain cloud, but there's no rain. Now, sometimes to us, rain is an inconvenience. But if you work in agriculture, you know how great of a blessing rain is. We cannot survive without rain. That's why we have cities here, and there are not cities like we have here all through the, the African desert, just contrast the population of an African desert with what we have here in North Alabama and look at the two via Google Maps and you see that one is green and one is brown and the reason that this is green is because of water. And these men are like clouds without water. They look like they're going to bring a refreshing rain, but there's no nourishment there. But Peter and Jude, again, are sharing the same exact thought in the same exact order. 2 Peter 3, 
speaks of the fact that, verse 3, knowing this first, there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lusts. Now look at the book of Jude, verse 18. Remember the words, verse 17, which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. He elaborates to a greater degree than we find in 2 Peter 3. These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. So if you wonder, who are these guys that are going to be in the last days who are mockers? Well, one thing we know about them is that they have not the Spirit. So that means that they're not born of the Spirit of God. They're unregenerate. They're natural men. They're carnal. They have not the Spirit of God. So when you read of the mockers in 2 Peter chapter 3, that gives you a little bit more information about them. So that's intriguing, isn't it? You have two books of the Bible written by two different men that follow the exact same outline beginning in 2 Peter chapter 2, continuing through chapter 3. 2 Peter 3 mentions the second coming of the Lord. The book of Jude mentions the second coming of the Lord and the judgment that he brings with him. Why do these two books follow the same general outline? There's a couple of options that I believe are reasonable as a word before sharing, these scriptures belong in the Bible. Amen? Amen. They belong in the Bible. Second Peter is written by the Apostle Peter. The book of Jude is written by Jude. The servants of Jesus, the brother of James, to them that are sanctified. These were written by first century apostolic, Holy Ghost inspired men. So why do we have two books that are written in the same exact order? Well, one might say, well, the Holy Spirit, independently one of the other, inspired both of them to write the exact same thing. Now, that's certainly an option. But more than likely, one of two things are true. They could be using the same source material. How many of you have heard a sermon that followed the same outline or the same ex? explanation of a sermon from a preacher maybe that was recorded a hundred years prior, a hundred years earlier in a book. I have. Now, I've heard preachers stand up and plagiarize other men's sermons where they write down all of the words of a sermon and they read the sermon as if it's their own sermon, but they really got it out of a book of sermons or something that somebody else has preached. Now, you say that never, ever happens. It does happen. It happens outside of our people, and I've heard it happen twice among our people, and that bothered me, greatly bothered me. You know, if my sermons are great, if my sermons are terrible, if some of them are great or some of them are terrible, never, ever, ever am I reading someone else's sermon in the pulpit. Ever, 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 ever. If I get a point from someone that is profound, I'm going to share with you my source because that's just called being a person of integrity. For example, how many of you have heard me quote James Oliphant? Just an example of this. And his definition that faith in you is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Everybody raises their hand because I do that all the time. I got that from whom? From Elder J.H. Oliphant. And so when I use that point, I say I got this from Elder James Oliphant. And just this past week, actually two weeks ago, I actually read that in the writings of John Leland as well. So that tells me that that was a common thing for Baptists to say 200 years ago. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the biblical definition of faith. Which is why people do wonderful things by faith, because it's done by Christ in them, the hope of glory. But I always tell you my source. These men could have been quoting some pre-existing manuscript something else that had been written and circulated among the early churches. There were many books that were circulated among the early church that we don't have access to. Paul references another book to the Corinthians. So we have First and Second Corinthians, but there was an even earlier book to the Corinthians that we don't have today. It wasn't preserved. God didn't preserve it for us because he obviously didn't inspire it. Now, I can write a letter to a church to exhort them with ministerial authority, but that doesn't mean it's divinely inspired, and so God didn't preserve that. To the Galatians, I believe he references an epistle to the Laodiceans. We don't have that epistle to the Laodiceans. 
Even in the Old Testament, this is a reality. For example, if you've ever been reading through the Old Testament and came across, has it not, has it, is it not written in the book of Jasher? What is the book of Jasher? We don't have the book of Jasher. We don't know what the book of Jasher is. So while Scripture is inspired, it's also not to say that these men never quote other resources because, again, God uses the vocabulary and the knowledge and the experience of the men when he inspires it. That's why there's all this different shading in the language and the words and the writing style and the form of arguments and reasonings that we read from these various men. Peter and Jude could have been quoting maybe a sermon that they heard someone preach. Maybe that was a sermon that Jesus had preached. Maybe that was a sermon that someone else had preached. And so they, both being in the audience, they remembered that, the order, and so it begins to be something that's commonly spoken by ministers of that day, and it makes it into both of their epistles. That's a reasonable option. I think the majority view, though, is that what Peter's doing, because it's believed that 2 Peter is written after the book of Jude, that makes Jude's epistle older than 2 Peter, is that Peter is quoting the book of Jude and elaborating on what we read in the book of Jude. So the majority opinion, I believe, among scholars and commentators through history, at least that I've read, is that Peter is quoting Jude and elaborating on what we read in Jude. Now, this is a very helpful thing. There's a, there's a couple of points to take away from that in and of itself, and we'll, we'll move on from this and look at the examples of judgment in a minute. Number one, if God inspired for this to be in his book twice, don't you think that's important? If he inspired it to be put in that order in his word twice, it's got to be important for us to read and observe and know. And there are other books that are written in such a way. The book of Colossians mirrors the layout of the book of Ephesians, and they're considered sister epistles because Paul wrote them at the same time. And so many of the things that you read in Colossians have a parallel in the book of Ephesians, but it was the same author. Some might say that Titus is a... A similar epistle to 2 Timothy. Well, it was the same writer writing to the same type of person, his sons in the ministry. But when God inspires two different men at two different times to write the same thing to us, we really should take heed to what is being written. Another thing that's very helpful for us to understand about 2 Peter chapters 2 and 3 and Jude is that when you read something in 2 Peter and Jude also references it, Read the two as companion texts. So it's totally proper. It's fine and it's helpful and it's good. When you read 2 Peter, read the book of Jude. And when you read the book of Jude, read the book of 2 Peter. So if you read the passage in 2 Peter about Balaam, turn over to the book of Jude and read what Jude had to say about Balaam. When you read what Jude had to say about Sodom and Gomorrah, turn over to 2 Peter and read what Peter had to say about Sodom and Gomorrah. And what you find is God-inspired commentary. Don't we love commentary? One of the things that I love to do each week after writing what I think and believe about a passage based upon what I've read for years and years out of the Word of God and looked up words in the dictionary and spelled everything out for myself, I like to dig into other men's commentaries to make sure that I'm not off track. Sound commentaries, good men's writings and understanding of the Word of God. And I love to read and to learn the things that they have learned in their study of history and their study of language and their study of culture and take all of that together and embolden my understanding and enhance my understanding of the Word of God. Now, with Jude and Second Peter, you can literally do that with the Word of God itself. And this is something that you can apply to the entire New Testament when you read something in the New Testament talking about something in the Old Testament, what we have in the New Testament is God-inspired commentary on an event in the Old Testament. You get the explanation of maybe Jesus himself or Peter or Paul or James or John. You get the explanation of something that took place, commentary, that you can always trust. Sometimes what we read in the commentaries written by good sound men are not right because at best, we are men. 
And none of us as preachers have perfect understanding and perfect knowledge. But when you read Peter quoting Jude, you have perfect knowledge and perfect elaboration, perfect commentary, because it's inspired as the Word of God. So let's begin looking at these three examples. Wasn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Three examples of God's righteous indignation that stand as monuments of his judgment upon wickedness in the world. One last point before we look at them. People in America today don't like to talk about the judgment of God. And in this culture, it's popular among Christendom at large to ignore the judgment passages and to talk about maybe how God wants you to overcome in this world and how God will give you strength in your calamities in this world. And I'm not against the preaching of any biblical topic, but we should understand that coupled with the gospel of grace in the writings of the New Testament, in the writings of the Old Testament, and in the recorded sermons of Christ and the recorded sermons of the apostles. You always have the message of salvation coupled with the message of God's judgment. You might look at them as two sides of the same coin. I stole that word from my brother. Two sides of the same coin. We were talking about that last night because as we get to the close of the message today, what we're going to learn of is deliverance and salvation in the midst of this judgment. You always find salvation because these are two sides of the same coin. To teach only salvation without judgment leaves you wondering, what really, are, what really are we saved from? It's important to understand that there is divine judgment and justice coming upon the wicked. Lest the cross of Christ itself is diminished in its magnitude. If I'm only saved from annihilation, if I'm only saved from sleeping for eternity, if I'm only saved from maybe a hell that's a little worse than the heaven that God saved or delivered to, the cross of Christ is not viewed in its proper light. It saved me from an eternity of suffering that I deserved because God is a God of judgment and holiness and therefore indignation upon wickedness. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness and judgment to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that should live ungodly. Now, Peter starts this point here, for if God spared not, and then he goes on a long tangent about the types of wickedness and the types of deliverance that God has in store for people in this world. But the point is, if God spared them not, why should we think that he'll spare the wolf? Why would we think that he'll spare the false teacher? And the answer to that question is, he will not. He will judge them. In this life or in the life to come, he will judge the false teacher. So to answer that statement, to conclude that statement, because if you just read verse 4, it's, it sets up the tension, but it doesn't resolve the tension before the end of the verse. If he spared not, but the question doesn't end there. So to answer the question before we look at this example... The point he's making, if God spared not the angels that sinned, if he spared not the old world, if he spared not Sodom and Gomorrah, what makes us think that he'll spare those that would enslave his children and corrupt his word? He will not. He takes that, fathom this, he takes that as seriously as he took the angels that sinned, as he took the pre-flood violent world, and as he took the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. Our preachers get offended easily at things that are not right. Sometimes we might even get a little too irritated and behave a little too harshly because of the years of calluses that we build up from engaging in warfare with people about the word of God. But I want you to understand that God considers this such a crucial issue 
that it's likened unto angels sinning, the pre-flood world, and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So do you think that God takes the word of God and the proper teaching of that as a serious thing? Absolutely he does. Absolutely he does. So this first example is the angels that sinned. I would probably put this in the top three mysterious topics in the Word of God. Because if you read the book of Genesis, you don't have the story given, supplied, of when the angels sinned, how they sinned, and what happened to them, when, the timing of that. And so this is a very mysterious thing. We presume that this was in the beginning after their creation because we believe that Scripture indicates this, that before there was, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth in Ephesians 1.1, that prior to creation, there was only God. There was only God. You had no time, you had no space, and you had no matter. No time, no space, no matter. All of that finds its origin in Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, time, God, that's the power, created the heavens, that's the space, and the earth, that's the matter. Time, force, space, matter. All of that in Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created. Before God created, because of the testimony of Scripture, we assume that there was nothing but God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And by the way, I engaged in a little bit of a discussion with someone this week who denies the eternal sonship of Christ. We believe that Christ is eternally the Son of God. Now, they believe that Christ was eternally the Word of God, but they believe that He became the Son when He was incarnate. He became the Son of Man when He was incarnate. He was sent as the Son of God. And the question that none of them can answer is this. If there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one... If Christ became the Son of God at His incarnation, then what was God the Father for all of eternity? You see, you can't have God the Father without God the Son. How many of you were a father before you had a son? That doesn't make sense. No, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. I literally said, you have no choice but to say God the blank, God the Word, and God the Holy Ghost. You know, the three that bear record in heaven, the blank, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Because without the Son, you can't have a Father. So the Word was eternally the Word, but He was also eternally the Son of God. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Anyway, we don't know when the angels sinned. We assume, because of the fall of Satan... And what we know about the nature of everything that God made... That this happened in the Garden of Eden... Early in the book of Genesis, directly prior to the fall of man. Now, we don't actually know how long it took Adam and Eve to fall. We have their genealogy after the fall. We have the ages of people. We have timelines that take us all the way up into the time of Christ from the fall. But we don't actually have how long time passed between when Adam and Eve were created and when they rebelled against God and fell into sin when Adam partook of the fruit which God had commanded him not to eat. So that is a mystery. We don't believe it could be very long because God had commanded them to have children. And you have a perfect man and a perfect woman in a perfect world. It would not have been difficult at all to have children and they had not yet had any children. So it couldn't have been very long. However long that was, we presume the fall of the angels is directly before the fall of man because what takes place when Adam sinned is the old serpent, that old serpent, the devil, comes to Adam and tempts Adam. So by this point, Satan had to have rebelled against God because he's there tempting Adam and Eve. Satan would not have been tempting Adam and Eve had he not fallen. So sometime between when he was created... Now, by the way, Satan is a created being. Satan is not an eternal being. Satan is not the brother of Jesus. That is a heresy. You say, who believes that? 
Millions of people on this continent believe that, and it is a heresy. Jesus is not the brother of Satan. Jesus is the second person of the Godhead incarnate in human flesh. Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, the son of God, the son of man, the son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, the adopted son of Joseph, Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the anointed, the Messiah, many other names. He's not the brother of Satan. The devil, Satan, is listed as the ringleader of the angels that sinned. And it was the devil in the garden that tempted Eve. Eve, being beguiled by him, gave to her husband, he ate, he willfully disobeyed God. But at some point, Satan led, in some sense, a rebellion against God. How did this happen? Now read this again. The angels that sinned. God made everything good, yea, very good. Angels that are evil were not made in sin. They were made good, and yet they sinned. According to a couple of Old Testament passages, we might find a little bit of a clue into this. In speaking to two different Old Testament pagan kings, God, through the prophets, speak to them using language that was alluding to Satan. Okay, now God sometimes does this. Do you remember what even Jesus said unto Peter when Peter said, you're not going to go die, you're not going to be betrayed? Far be it. What did Jesus say to Peter? Get thee behind me, Satan. So sometimes God will use the word Satan to describe a man when a man is behaving sinfully. That's not unprecedented or out of the question. In speaking to the king of Tyrus, the king of Tyre, in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now, was the king of Tyre in Eden, the garden of God? No, the king of Tyre was not in Eden, the garden of God. But he's describing the king as if he were describing Satan, presumably. He goes on to say, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou walked up and downs in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in all thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So if this is using descriptions of Satan to describe this wicked king, then what God is saying is that like Satan, you were upright in a sense, and now you have sinned, you're anointed, and yet you have fallen. But if that's true of Satan, then that wicked one was an anointed cherub that was perfect in the day that he was created, which means Satan is a created being, but iniquity was found in him. Well, when was iniquity found in him? We might have a clue for that in the book of Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14 is speaking to the king of Babylon. And again, he's talking to a pagan king and using terms that are true for Satan to describe the man because that's a judgment against him. It's like saying, get thee behind me, Satan. What did Jesus say of Judas Iscariot? Have I not chosen you and one of you is a devil? So this happens in the word of God. In the book of Isaiah chapter 14, he speaks... In verse, four, verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Now, what would be the sin of Satan then? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Stars many times in the word of God are representative of angels. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. If that is using things that are true of Satan to describe a wicked king, then it's true that Satan in his heart said, I will ascend and be like God. I will rival God. So then the pride of that wicked one would be the pride, or excuse me, the sin of that wicked one would be pride and self-exaltation, even to the level of he wanted to exalt himself to be like God. 
By the way, what was the temptation that he gave Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt be like God. Your eyes will be open, you'll be like God's. So the sin of Satan, presumably, is self-exaltation. There are Jewish fables and false teachings that say that the angels sinned and procreated with women, and that's why God sent the flood, because the women and the angels had children, and the angels were the giants. The problem with that is that there were giants after the flood. And they say, God killed all the inhabitants of the earth to get rid of the giants, to get rid of the half-breeds between angels and women. And so he sent the flood, and he killed all the angels. Excuse me, he killed all the giants. Okay, um, David and Goliath. That doesn't hold water. Jesus interprets Genesis 6 about the sons of God and the daughters of men as men giving in marriage, not angels. We have commentary on that in the Olivet Discourse. Again, when you read a New Testament quotation of an Old Testament passage, you have God-inspired commentary. The sin wasn't angels taking wives among women. The sin was that before the fall of man, Satan and his angels led a rebellion against God and exalted themselves. Now, how did this happen? How did this occur? Where did this warfare take place? Well, we know that sin could not exist before God. So in whatever sense that it took place, it had to take place somewhere outside of God's firsthand presence before his throne in glory. But beyond what I just read to you, it's a mystery. We do know, however, that because of this, they are reserved in chains of darkness. Now, what does it mean, chains of darkness? Well, this is spiritually speaking. They're condemned in their fallen state. Now, God is light, and in him is no darkness. John chapter 1, 1 John 1, 5, in him is no darkness. His children are referred to as the light of the world in Matthew chapter 5. So light and darkness in the Bible are often used to depict holiness and wickedness. These, uh, these angels are reserved, they are reserved in chains of darkness... They're in chains of sin and depravity, and they're bound in it, and they're reserved unto judgment. By the way, the Word of God in Philippians chapter 2 is referred to as light. God, His people, His church, His Word, His gospel, this is the light that is in this world, and the wickedness of this world is darkness. Light shines through darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not, John chapter 1. These men, or these angels rather, are reserved in chains of darkness. And I've got to move quickly. According to Matthew 25, 41, eternal torments and punishment are reserved for the devil and his angels. The devil and his angels. Now those are the explicit words that Jesus used. That's not implied. That's not try to solve the mystery with... Vague passages, Jesus says, the devil and his angels. That means that the devil has angels. Now, the devil didn't create these angels. These were the angels that rebelled with that wicked one in the beginning of time. They were created upright, they rebelled against God, and they are now fallen, reserved in chains of darkness. By the way, Paul uses the word elect in reference to the angels that didn't sin, the elect angels. So you have the angels that sinned and you have the elect angels. Matthew 25, 41 says that hell is reserved for them. Continuing, spare not the old world, but save Noah, the eighth person. The old world, the world that was before the flood in the days of Noah, looked different than the world that we live in today. This world that we live on, this planet, this planet has been scarred and damaged by a deluge, a flood that covered the entire globe. That's why we have mountains. That's why we have canyons. That's why we have crevices. That's why we have caves. That's why we have the planet that we live on today, scarred as it is. We live in a world that's once covered by an ocean that destroyed the whole world that was a judgment from God. The heavens, the windows of heaven were opened. The fountains of the great deep were opened. You say, well, where did all of that water go? Well, I would introduce you to the Pacific Ocean. How did it get there? Well, when the fountains of the Great Deep were opened, and then 
the land collapses under it, caves, subterranean water, the ground collapses, then you have it rushing down to it, and you have land that moves up, which is why we have the mountains. So the world that was then is different than the world that is today. The world that was then, if you read the book of Genesis, and we'll just comment briefly because we're nearly out of time, we read that the hearts of men were only evil continually. The hearts of men were only evil continually. Because of this, in Genesis 6, it grieved God at his heart. Now, that's going to be one of your takeaways today. We'll come back to that. It grieved God at his heart. And he said, it repents me that I have made man on the earth. It grieved him to such a degree that it repented him. He experienced remorse for creating mankind why? Because the hearts of man was only evil continually. The whole earth was filled with violence. The earth was a violent place. Violence was everywhere. There are sermons you could preach on why that happens, and I'm not going to chase the tangent because I don't have time. But the earth was filled with violence, and so because of that, God says, I will not always struggle with man. His days shall be 120 years. That doesn't mean that God cut the lifespan of man to 120 years. It meant that in 120 years, I'm going to send a flood and I'm going to clean the slate. But then we also find in Genesis 6, but Noah found grace in the eyes of God. What was it that delivered that man? Now, he was upright and perfect in all of his generations, but what was said about him before you read about his uprightness? Noah found grace. If you are an upright man, what is it that you have found in the eyes of God, in the heart of God, in the sight of God? Grace. What is grace? Unmerited favor. You see, all the way back in Genesis chapter 6, you read where there's coming judgment, the world will be destroyed, and the only thing that stands between you as an individual and that judgment is grace. Grace is not a New Testament, an exclusively New Testament concept. All the way back in Genesis 6, you read where a man was saved from judgment by grace. Now, this man was not the eighth from Adam, says the eighth man, but he was the eighth person on the ark. See, there were seven other people there, his wife, his three sons, and their three wives. And through them, we had a repopulation of the earth. And the final judgment, the final testimony of judgment, the example, is Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I'm going to have to summarize that instead of reading the narrative. You can go back and read Genesis 18 and Genesis 19 on your own today. God comes to Abraham, the Lord, with two angels, L-O-R-D, capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah, the covenant name of God, Jehovah. When you read Lord in all caps in the Old Testament, it translates from the word that translates Jehovah. Jehovah comes to Abraham and he says, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Their wickedness has come up all the way before me in glory, and I'm going to judge them, and I'm going to destroy them. Abraham says, Lord, are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? What if there be 50 there? God says, I won't destroy it for 50. Abraham says, well, I guess he got to thinking about it. He got to thinking about the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah. He got to thinking about maybe realistically what the place looked like, and he begins to Drop the number down and drop the number down. And finally, he says, Lord, let not the Lord be angry. I'll speak yet but this once. Peradventure adventure, ten be found there. Ten righteous people. Will you destroy it if there are ten righteous people there? And God said, I will not destroy it for ten sake. And he went his way. In the next chapter, two angels arrive at Sodom. And the men of that city attempt to pull these angels out into the street and to abuse them. And you know what I mean. These angels strike the men with blindness the next morning and say, take your daughters, take your wife, and get out of here. Lot tarries. The angels literally have to take the man and physically remove him. And by the conclusion of Genesis 19, God rains fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. Because they sought after strange flesh. Now, people try to redefine Sodom and Gomorrah in our culture today to say, well, it wasn't the sin of sexual immorality or homosexuality that was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. They were unwelcoming. They were not given to hospitality. 
That was one of their problems. But what does Jude say? They pursued strange flesh. What did they try to do with the angels? Bring them out that we may know them. You know what that euphemism has reference to? No, it's exactly as the church has said it is. What the people of Israel said it was. What we've known it was for thousands of years. You know what the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah is. And because of that, God destroyed it. Now let's close with these three takeaways. Number one, God will judge. The same way he judged the angels, the same way he judged the old world, the same way he judged Sodom and Gomorrah, God will judge the wicked. And he'll judge the false teacher. Number two, things like this grieve him. What did he do? What did he say before he destroyed the world? It grieved him at his heart because of the sinfulness. Now, he will execute his wrath, but many times people look at predestinarians and they say, you know, your, your God created a world knowing that these people were going to do this, predestinating them to do this just so he could take pleasure in destroying them. But from Genesis we read where it grieved God. It repented him at his heart that he had even made them. Understand that his justice is a necessity, but when God looks at the sinfulness of man, he's, he's not creating them wicked just so he can destroy them. That's not the biblical fact of the matter. They did that. They did that. He made them upright. But number three, and we close with this, God will deliver his people. He will deliver you. In the case of the flood, in the midst of all of the destruction, you found an example of what? Salvation. Deliverance from the flood with Noah and his family. In the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, what do you find? You find an example of deliverance. Who was delivered? Lot. Even to the degree that the angels had to literally pick him up and move him out of the city. Even if we're too dumb to realize what's going on around us like Lot, God will deliver his own. He delivered just Lot, whose righteous soul was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Lot, as we read here, was vexed because of the wickedness of that place. Dilly-dally and dragging his feet, not wanting to get out, God sends angels to pick him up and take him out of the place. And he delivered Lot, even though Lot was clueless to what was taking place. I think Lot is the man of the greatest blunders of the Bible. He's in the top five, greatest blunders of the Bible. Go back and read the account, Genesis 19, when you get home. Verse 9, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. God will deliver you because you found grace in his sight. May we pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for these examples that we have in your word of judgment because we know that injustice would be an atrocity. And while we know that we're just as guilty... And we deserve your wrath, Lord. You carried out your wrath that you had for us because you loved us, because we found grace on your Son upon the cross. We know, Father, there's coming a day when you'll judge all of the world by that man, Christ Jesus. We pray, Father, that we would rejoice in your deliverance. You've promised to deliver us. Thank you, Lord, for this great salvation. Thank you for the example of Noah and Lot, that even in the midst of your judgment, while the world around us burns or is destroyed by fire, because we know you, because you saved us, we anticipate being delivered from that. Father, thy will be done. Let God be true and every man a liar. Thy judgment is good, it is true, it is holy. And we bow the knee to your submission, King of kings and Lord of lords. We confess that Jesus is Lord of all. Forgive us of our many sins, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.